Hello, listeners, and welcome to another episode of Subscriptions Guild. I'm your host, Christy Beasley. Our guest today is Jack Purcell, who is a business development at Giotis. Thanks. How are you doing today? And thanks for coming on the show. Yeah, thank you for having me, Christy. I'm doing well. So do you want to tell us a little bit about yourself and the company? Yeah. So Geodis is a third-party logistics provider. Uh, we have a global network in over 170 different countries. Uh, we're French-based, but we're actually one of the fastest-growing 3PLs in America. And our headquarters is based in Brentwood, Tennessee. Our core cool business, contract logistics, so that'd be warehousing, fulfillment, uh, freight forwarding, ARC, container, less than container, and domestic transportation. So th that's really our core business. And then the team I'm on, Geodis My Parcel, is our foray into uh, e-commerce. And my product, My Parcel, is actually international fulfillment uh, direct to consumer from the U.S. Uh, to international destinations. Okay, interesting. So what are some of the challenges or opportunities for subscription-based businesses? Um, you talked about being international. So have you had any experience with cross-border um, with your e-marketplace? Yeah. I mean, as far as the opportunities go, when you look at cross-border trade, uh, projected to grow by over 25% uh, through 2028, and that would bring the total market to over $3 trillion. So when you look at that explosive growth in the international market on a macro scale, it's really undeniable. And then when you look at the micro scale, you know, those individual subscription box owners and operators, I think it's a very interesting opportunity because so many of these boxes present such a niche product, right? So by expanding internationally, you're really just opening up to um, – you know, 4X, 5Xing your market, even just by just going into the UK, Canada, and EU for people who may or may not, you know, have a need for that niche that your box is filling. So on an opportunity um, front, you know, there's plenty for the international expansion for subscription boxes. Uh, and then you mentioned the risks, which all these subscription boxes, you know, they're going to know the risks associated with shipping domestically, right? You're relying on third party uh, partners. You've got tracking, you've got returns. So once you take those problems international, they kind of compound, right? So not only do you have these same issues, but you've got compliance with, you know, the numerous border authorities that you have to deal with. Um, returns become even more complicated since you're crossing borders to and from. Yeah, and yeah just on the com on the compliance front, uh, knowing your de minimis is, which is the value under which you won't owe duties and taxes, that varies by country. Um, so, yeah, the opportunity being an exploding international market and the risks really centered around complexity and providing a top tier customer experience across borders, which can be a challenge even domestically. Yeah. So, I mean, I think that brings up a really good point. I'm sure there's a ton of people that are operating in, in the United States now, but they are looking to expand internationally. And that is kind of an overwhelming um, task to take on, especially if you don't know the regulatory or international compliance. So how do you help merchants deal with that? Like, are you active helping them understand the legislation and regulations? Um, does your... Yeah system provide tracking or any type of guidance? Yeah, when we're starting up a customer, we really focus a lot on compliance. You know, that as Geodisc represents our biggest risk, making sure there's no hazardous materials. You know, sometimes things can get as complicated as certain fabrics or certain uh, chemicals that maybe are used in beauty products in the U.S that won't be allowed in other countries. So re we really take a lot of that off the plate of the merchants, you know, by, like you said, our systems up to date, making sure we're flagging hazmat. We make sure all these items before they're going international are gonna be tagged with a harmonization code. And that's basically how all the different countries identify their product. So that's how my parcel helps to mitigate some of that risk um, and then on the something else we do to mitigate on the uh, customer service front. So the difference in international commercial terms, you've got DDP and DDU. DDP being duties, taxes paid. So that means at checkout, 
the customer knows what they owe in duties, what they owe in taxes. That's that total landed cost. So that's the service we provide. And that DDP really is becoming uh, the standard in the international market. Whereas DDU, uh, duties, taxes, unpaid, that means as a product's going through compliance or sometimes when it's being delivered to the final customer's door, they're going to owe those duties and taxes at that point, which you know, you would never expect a domestic customer to not know exactly what they owe when they buy the product. And that same expectation really is uh, applying to international consumers as well. So how do you recommend merchants um, handle those charges? Do they get passed on to the customer or do you see merchants that try to absorb those on their side? Typically, you're going to see the final consumer pay, pay those, you know, duties and taxes, there's not a competitive advantage to be derived there. You know, these certain products at this value will incur these duties and taxes, and those will be presented um, in the shopping cart with a good DDP solution. So, you know, they are still paying more for these products, but as you know, sometimes substitutions aren't readily available. We talked about for the subscription boxes, they're so niche. So that duties and taxes, Like I explained with the growing international market, people are willing to pay those for the right products. Okay. Yeah. So you typically, you see the the client displaying that as part of the total purchase price to the user. So if they paid for it up front, right, then the duties would be covered by the time it's delivered. So it's not like collecting on delivery for the duties and taxes. Exactly. And, And that's really one of our keys. You know, a big problem with these DDU services are, uh, abandoning items in the cart. And that's something that um, has been found that, you know, if someone doesn't know exactly what they're going to pay in the cart, that is one of the reasons that can lead people to abandon in cart, which, you know, it's as easy as, like you said, letting them know what they're going to pay up front. And that can avoid a lot of headaches uh, or even prevent a customer from wanting to be a repeat customer. Yeah, I mean, earlier you mentioned um, refunds, right? So if you're not notifying customers ahead of time and then they are getting charged extra because of the dues and fees, I'm sure that brings a lot of refunds or, you know, reporting back to the card brands or network saying, you know, I was overcharged, wasn't notified of this. So how do you recommend handling refunds in those situations? Well, because we're a DDP service, hopefully, you know, you won't have people declining that at their door. But really, the challenge, like you said, is going to be more on the physical return on the product versus a refund, right? A refund domestically versus internationally can be handled. But then when you look at your returns process internationally, that's where things really get complicated. You have to weigh, you know, do we bring this product back to America Is there somewhere overseas that I can store it until it sells? Do I destroy it? Is it not worth bringing home? So, you know, the refund piece, that's going to happen. But then as far as the supply chain challenges of selling internationally, the return piece is what can often be a a challenge for any seller. And so how do do merchants typically track um, and how do they know their options, right? So if you're Right. If you have a product that is stuck in another country and you have the option of sending it to another country or sending it back, like how do they yeah. know what those options are? And I'm sure from the is, merchant's perspective. Yeah. From a merchant's perspective. And also I'm assuming, you know, how do they handle that? Like, how do I know that yeah. it's acceptable materials going to this country versus non-acceptable materials going to another country? Right. So I'll start with the end piece. You know, that's where that upfront compliance homework that we do matters so much going in because once we have your item list, we have your SKUs, we know uh, what products you're using to manufacture them, we're able to ensure that we're not going to let you send anything to a country where it would not be accepted at customs. And then as far as the returns options, that's something where even us now are having to do that on largely a case-by-case basis. And that's because it's not always clear cut that this product won't be destroyed there. You know, if it's worth 15 bucks, whatever it is, then it might make more sense to destroy it over there and write it off rather than ship it back. So as far as determining a return solution, that's going to be on a case by case basis. 
But, you know, we work very closely with the brands to make sure they're comfortable with our final solution and that we find something that works for them because it can be done, right? It's just the reverse supply chain becomes complex, uh, doubly so internationally. So we do that on a case by case basis. Okay. So you kind of work with merchants up front to kind of make those decisions and then it's just kind of set up and go on the back end. So they're not having to review, you know, case by case. Um, that's kind of the system handling that for them, correct? Right. Yeah. Once we're up and going, the reverse supply chain will function, taking a load off of these sellers. Um, but, you know, this is the, these are the very real challenges that we're trying to solve in the international direct to consumer space. So th this is what uh, me and our team spend all day on trying to figure out how to make it easier. So I guess with all of um, like the issues that are going on with the supply chain and things um, today, how do you keep up to date with different countries changing restrictions or what's allowed, what's stuck, what can't countries that aren't exporting yeah. or importing. So how do you keep up with that? Right. That is, that is uh, constantly changing. You know, that, that is where we derive our biggest advantage, I think, of being a global logistics provider. So when you're talking about cross-border compliance, uh, expediting orders, knowing what's allowed where and when, that's one of our core competencies um, and, and that really is just a product of Geodis's growth over the past 10 to 15 years has really made it a global player. And, um, you know, introducing a product like Geodis My Parcel is really just leveraging that cross-border expertise. So to your point, that is something that we constantly have to stay up on. But generally, you know, you're, you're not going to have total 180s either. Um, so you're not going to say, hey, if it's over 50 percent polyester, it's no longer allowed. If that's just a totally new direction for the customs and compliance agencies of the com of the country that's receiving the goods. But, yeah, staying on part of that is a, a huge piece of what we do. And uh, it's a, some real value that we're able to provide merchants. Do you have any functionality that allows for like dispute resolution? So if something does arrive um, that is supposed to be allowed to pass through in the country is, um, you know, saying it, it's not in compliance. Do you have means to be able to help settle those risks? Settle those? Yeah, absolutely. So, so one thing we do, we actually pre-clear our um, parcels as they're entering. So for instance, um, we inject into the EU through the Netherlands and they have a list. Whenever a plane's coming over daily with our parcels, that are meant for the EU, they're able to pre-clear those beforehand. But if something were to get stopped, you know, this pre-clear process and our relationship with customs compliance definitely helps avoid those type of issues. But 100 percent, we would not give up on a parcel at the border um, if for whatever reason it was held up. You know, just to build on that a little more, you know, from the merchant's perspective or that e-shopper, the international e-shopper, we have a toll-free 1-800 line. So if someone's tracking and they see it's been at uh, customs for two days, we have a, a toll-free line that you call. And that would be how to get in touch with, right, someone to resolve those problems. But there definitely are steps to free things up at the border uh, if they were to get stopped. But our pre-clearance activity uh, really mitigates a lot of that risk. Okay. Yeah. Interesting. So, um, so one of the other things that you did mention that I know is um, a pain point for a lot of merchants is how to improve the cart abandonment. So along with the duty and taxes, do you have any other recommendations? Like you just talked about like the shipping, right? So are you able to tell mm -hmm. them a delivery date or an estimated delivery date based upon right. you knowing where it's going and how long it's going to take to get cleared and stuff like that? Yeah. Well, you nailed it, Christy. Uh, a lot of the things that also will lead to cart abandonment are not knowing shipping time in the shopping cart. So for these DDU services, uh, they're what we call consolidators. So they are waiting for parcels to come in and then they will consolidate. Um, but that could take an indeterminate number of days, right? So a lot of these, and then there's no tracking for these DDU services. So if you're in the shopping cart, and you don't know your total landed costs, there's no duties or taxes, you don't know your shipping time, um, 
that, that it's really easy at that point to walk away from the cart. You know, as great as the product or the subscription box might be, those are real pl- problems that people are making quick decisions, right? And then something else we talked on the returns process. If there isn't a returns process, if there's not a clear returns process, uh, that's something else that can contribute to cart abandonment. And, you know, especially for these subscription box where one sale could turn into a lifelong customer, you know, you hate to see that abandoned in the shopping cart. Yeah. And you got to get it right the first time. There's a lot of, if you don't get it right the first time, a lot of them to continue with subscription. So, yeah. 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 That's a, that's a very interesting point. And the subscription space, you know, it adds in all of those challenges. You have a built-in customer or you've got the risk of a one and done. So yeah, definitely. So I definitely feel like, um, in the United States, at least, um, with Amazon and other, you know, quick shipping things that are out there, I feel like a lot of merchants are expected to ship very quickly and be able to track their package and get it out the door. So do you feel like that carries over internationally? Um, yeah. I mean, when, when you look at, when you talk about benchmarks in the e-commerce space, Amazon is basically, you know, the benchmark setter. And what have they done? They've conditioned domestic American consumers for one to two day shipping, never out of stock. And that's great because, and that has created the expectation for those increased um, shipping times. And I do believe that uh, applies internationally, Um, you know, not to harp on the DDU, but when you look at indeterminate amount of days to get delivered at an indeterminate cost that you might owe at your door, that is not what uh, domestic or international consumers expect at this point. Um, I also thought it was interesting to bring up Amazon. You know, I think an important piece for these merchants um, to think about is, you know, how they maintain their brand control when you have the Amazons of the world who are able to set these standards and fulfill. But that also presents some uh, issues as well, right? They could be presenting you right next to competitors. Um, so they're just kind of loading up substitutions for you, which is never a good thing. Um, so yeah, we, as a shipping provider, you know, we, uh, obviously view Amazon as the competition. They set these benchmarks, but I think an important thing for us is, you know, we come and meet you where you are technology wise. So we can integrate with your e-commerce platform, integrate where you're printing your labels. And now when those orders comes in, they're not seeing Amazon. They're not seeing competitors. They're seeing your brand, you know, what they're going to pay total landed costs, how long it's going to take to get there and a tracking number. And to your initial point, right, on customer expectations, that, that is what people want to see before they pull the trigger as an international e-shopper. Yeah. I mean, I've purchased tons of things that are coming from outside the United States. And if I didn't know when it was going to arrive or how much it was going to be, I'd probably be a little upset when I didn't get it on the time that I was expecting or, you know, there's extra fees associated with it when I got it. So, yeah. So one thing that you just mentioned is the fact that merchants, um, you know, have this way of calculating their shipping ahead of time. So for subscription merchants, getting it over there, the first shipment quickly is very important. But also I feel like being able to predict delivery times so that I know when I have to have my box prepared and ready. So that is also something that you can help merchants establish as a general month timeline of by this date, I need to have things prepared so that I can have them ready to ship. Yeah, definitely. Um, you know, depending on where the merchants located, uh, we can give an accurate time of what it takes to get to one of our sort facilities in the U.S. to get it going internationally. And then, you know, once it's at our sort facility, uh, we've been going with a three to nine day delivery time. Uh, We're closer to about four and a half. So, yeah, that's something that we can definitely do for subscription box merchants, you know, give a realistic time frame. And then, you know, we don't have a minimum volume or anything like that. So I understand with these subscription boxes, it might be a few days a month they're shipping or a few days a quarter they're shipping. So in addition to making sure that customer knows when they're going to get it, we can definitely handle that um, peak and valley volume. That is kind of, it seems like it would be uh, standard for the subscription box industry just by nature. 
So one thing that you did mention is brand reputation and recognition. Um, and I know that is very important to a lot of merchants that are in the subscription business. So how do you recommend them keeping a pulse on their brand reputation and recognition when they're shipping internationally? Do you have any tips or tricks? Yeah. Yeah. So I, I think coming back to, you know, having a carrier partner that can meet you where you are technology wise. So when someone comes to your website to order your subscription box, you know, they are seeing your presentation, um, you know, your marketing, everything you want to be front and center. And then at checkout, you know, you still control um, things like the duty and tax calculation, uh, you know, using us as a partner, you can decide where that's shown in the shopping cart or after checkout. Um, but I think the important part is, you know, throughout the checkout process, they are remaining in your technology ecosystem. And then, you know, partnering with carriers that maintain your same level of customer service expectations, I think is incredibly important because what you don't want to see is, you know, you put so much pride into your subscription box, so much pride into your website. And then, you know, God forbid, uh, a parcel falls into a black hole and you can't track it. And, you know, customs may or may not have gotten it. And now you've got an upset in customer. And that really reflects on your brand as well. So I, I think for all these merchants who put so much into their um, product, you know, I, I think it's very front and center to make sure that they're bringing uh, partners into their ecosystem so that their message stays front and point. And then, yeah, carriers and partners that they can trust uh, to provide the highest level of customer service possible for that end consumer. Because, you know, internationally, it goes for domestic as well. You've kind of got one chance to make that first impression. So, you know, maintaining your brand rep reputation on the website throughout the checkout process and then partnering with um, people and companies that uh, you trust to make the best customer service decisions, I think is the best way to, um, you know, maintain that brand that these people have been cultivating. Yeah. So you have, sounds like you have a lot of experience working um, and getting a lot of these merchants onboarded and understanding the shipping part of their subscription business. Do you have any uh, case studies or client um, testimonials, experiences that you can share about how you were able to help them solve a difficult problem? Yeah. So we are a very new product um, and testimonial is not easy to come by. So I don't really have any case studies to jump to right this moment, um, specifically for the um, subscription boxes. So maybe we edit this question out. Okay. <laughs> okay. Yeah. We can edit that one out. Um, Sorry. <laughs> yeah, I, I just didn't have a good one ready. So do you have, I mean, do you have any client, you don't have any clients that are using the platform now? This is still not part of the recording part, but yeah. so can you talk we, we, we about clients? We don't have any subscription. Okay. Um, can um, you, I, can, I mean, utilize any of your clients? I can, I can go back to a lot of the challenge. Sorry, go ahead. I, I was just thinking if you could use any of your clients. I lost you right there, Christy. Any of my clients. Uh, yeah. If there's there any go. clients, like it doesn't have to be a subscription business, but if you can just talk about any of the use cases that you helped, um, solve, um, shipping or, you know, yeah. But is that something that you can talk yeah. about? It doesn't have to be a subscription client. Okay. I mean, r really what I want to say is, you know, most people are kind of stuck with the same issue of, you know, a high level of service with integrators versus a reduced cost with consolidators. And where we come in are providing those DDP integrator um, services at closer to a consolidator price point. So a lot of our customers come in, you know, either they've been using an integrator and it's not cost um, appropriate for the international shipper. Because when you are looking at $50, $60 for a, you know, $30 or $40 product, that might be price prohibitive for the international client. But then when you look at what we talked about, the two to three week or indeterminate shipping time, that's also a challenge that these merchants face. 
So that's where Geodis My Parcel comes in. You know, our goal is to provide that high level of service at a reduced cost. And, you know, we're not quite an integrator because they own all of their assets from point to point. And we're not a consolidator. We don't wait to build optimal loads before we ship. And then we do provide a lot of these, uh, you know, expectations for customer service that the international e-shipper looks for. Um, you know, that's the DDP, full track and trace, address verification. So, you know, in the international space, those are the problems that we're helping solve. Yeah, I mean, I think you're hitting on a lot of things that a lot of merchants probably have no clue or really have even thought of, especially if you're trying to launch a box, which is, you know, address verification and standardization and things like right. that, that, you know, if you don't have a good shipping partner, you could have a lot of return to products that come back to you that you then have to pay the correct postage and shipping charges to get them there again. So having having something in place to help you with some of that up front is probably a very helpful tip for some of the people that are just launching. Yeah, absolutely. And just, you know, talking about the whole point being scaling, right? These subscription boxes. I think it's really interesting to think about the perceived challenges of shipping internationally and uh, scaling in that way. Really today with our processes, you're able to keep shipping from where you are, but gain access to a global market. So, I mean, th these challenges are daunting and they are real, but there are partners out there, you know, such as Geodis, my parcel that can really alleviate those and help scale your box very quickly. Okay. So I guess one question that I'm, I'm kind of having trouble putting my mind around is how, how as a merchant, when I have an order that needs to be shipped, how do I get it to you to start the So like first mile? Yeah. Yeah. So, so, so our solution for smaller merchants, um, we actually have an account set up with UPS and you schedule a pickup. So say you have, you know, five to seven boxes a day and you need to get it to Chicago or sort facility for international disbursement at no additional cost. You go into UPS, schedule a pickup using our account number and then UPS uh, ground gets that to Chicago, at which point we take over and disperse internationally to those uh, final consumers. Okay. Interesting. And and then as you grow, you know, larger subscription boxes, you know, hopefully this leads to increased volume, but we have LTL solutions as well, um, depending on your place of business. So we have a lot of first mile opportunities to get that uh, to our sort facility. But, you know, once that initial pickup happens, we take over and operationally cross border. That's where we really thrive. So I guess one thing that a lot of merchants struggle with is when they're using a new partner or a new system, um, how do they plug that into their existing infrastructure? So if I already have an e-commerce website or a, a customer database or just a spreadsheet, like how do I plug the shipping components into my existing applications? Right. So I, I know from Subta, which is where we met, a lot of people have Shopify stores, which is an excellent tool, you know, and we are able to integrate uh, via our partners for order, order label creation and for the duty and tax calculation directly into the Shopify website. So there's a number of other um, e-commerce platforms that we also integrate with. So you have your storefront set up. And we're just a couple of apps away from integrating with you, being able to choose Geodis My Parcel as a carrier at checkout, know your duties and taxes. And then, you know, we say three to nine days, typically around four to five uh, to get that international parcel delivered. And, and that goes back to what I was saying, right, about us coming to meet you where you are with your technology. So that that's really our goal uh, in the integration phase is to be able to integrate with as many e-commerce platforms as pop possible, as quickly as possible, so that when you make that decision, you know, my parcel is the right product for me, the, the steps to integrate are relatively simple. Okay. Well, that's good to hear. Um, I know that a lot of merchants, you know, don't always have yeah. like a tech staff that's on site. So having a plug-in with an existing e-commerce platform, that can be very helpful and easy to get from the ground right. running. So. 
Yeah. And to your point, you know, we do offer API integrations, but if you don't have an IT team, it's not like you can't add a carrier or add technologies that we're partnering with, which like you said, is great news. Yeah. So um, I guess one thing to ask would be, is there any, if somebody wanted to know how to find you on the marketplace or in general, um, how would they be able to locate you? Okay, Jack. Well, we're running um, out of time, but it has been great talking with you today. I really enjoy, you know, we talk to a lot of merchants that talk about launching their bro- their boxes and their subscription services, but it's interesting to have somebody that's in a very niche portion of that whole process that can come on and share some tips with business users and merchants and customers on what really is going on behind the scenes and why they can improve their process. So I've enjoyed this podcast just from learning a little bit more about the shipping process. Yeah, well, thank you for having me on. I've enjoyed myself as well. Yeah, and so you mentioned um, that you are available on some of the um, platforms. If a customer is looking to get in touch with you to learn more, how would they go about doing that? Yeah, uh, Geodis, G-E-O-D-I-S, myparcel.com is the landing page website for the Geodis My Parcel product. Um, right now, our two big integration paths are Shopify and WooCommerce, but we can work to integrate with a lot of different ones uh, using some of those same processes I talked about. Um, yeah, my email, jack.purcell at geodis.com. Uh, if you have any questions or want to connect specifically, I would be happy to help you. Okay. Well, thank you very much for um, stopping by today and being on the podcast. Yeah, thank you very much, Christy. (laughs) Thanks. Bye.